engineer by trade, I started in the microelectronics area and moved into what I call and favour as a term electronic systems because you can't treat electronics anymore as a separate thing and you can't treat um, products as just a s hardware or software. They are systems and system product is, is where we've moved to. So what my motivation on here is that um, in my tours around the country I've come across people who are representing groups like EPSRC, the uh, European Commission uh, and uh, government institutes which essentially are all looking at science for its exploitation plan. They're looking for um, some return on investment on their investment and just to put a scale on it EPSRC is investing around a billion pounds a year on research for good programs. So they aren't doing it entirely out of charity because um, politicians have to approve that budget and politicians are representatives of people, the people in the community and so they are effectively representing of the taxpayer. So they have to go back to government and say look we, we need to have a budget of a billion and uh, you will approve it won't you and as long as the people the general people agree that it's a good thing to do they will approve it but essentially they want to see return on that investment and that is predominantly seen through local industries local employment contributing to GDP that's what they're looking for so they're looking for research ha which has some link they need to see that to, to, to justify or the, ultimately the budgets will be cut. So the question really which tends to come up on a fairly regular basis is why is industry slow to pick up what is highly, relate, highly regarded, highly rated research outcomes? We have world leading universities, they're producing stuff which rates very highly on any scores which are going. Um, and yet, if anything, that t the technologies, the science that comes out of these tend to be picked up by industries from other countries, not from here. Um, and why is industry only mildly interested in supporting re these research programs anyway? Why don't more industries come forward to universities and, and say to them, you know, we want to do this research, we want to par partner with you because it would be valuable for us in some way. And I think it's, uh, it's, these are frustrations and so I'm hoping that I will be able to, to touch on some of these and give you some answers. Now, we talk about technology products. We talk about them rather glibly. These are all technology products. They contain technology or they are technology. Um, but you have to bear in mind that when people are buying products like this, they're not buying the technology at all. They're buying the functionality that they offer. So a camera takes pictures, you can read books, you can tell the time and you can communicate, you can print, you can wash clothes. Those are all functional things. They're not technology related things at all. And these a whole bunch of other things, you know, power systems, money, transport, um, personal transport, even things like logistics around availability of water and food are all invisible forms of technology. But they're valued by the customer because the customer knows that if it didn't have them then the world would be a, be a worse place than it is uh, today. So they still have an end customer value even though they're not bought specifically as individual items. Now products all contain components and there's a lot of terms here people use system, subsystem, components but they don't really understand what they mean. Uh, they know that, if you like, the system is perhaps more closely related to the product. There are subsystems inside them, but they tend to be focusing on the hardware objects that might appear in it. But there is software and there's optics and there's um, radio and other techniques and technologies. There's even metalwork. Um, there's glass technology in the, your, your average smartphone. There's a lot of subsystems which go into these and you mustn't ignore things like support. You can't make a smartphone do anything if it doesn't have a radio connection to an infrastructure and a link to the internet. Those are part of the thing which has to be provided at some stage. They're a component of the thing that you buy when you buy a smartphone. And then they, you have ultimately very low level components, resistors, capacitors but you also have 
virtual components, components which don't have a physical entity. You can't pick them up and stick them onto a board, so you can put software into that domain. But there's also knowledge and mathematics, so digital signal processing. You, the algorithms are designed somewhere. They're a component of that smartphone when you pick it up. And finance, we mustn't, include, uh, mustn't exclude that. If the finance isn't there, it doesn't matter whether the rest of it is there. But if the, if the uh, optics aren't there, then you haven't got a smartphone by a current definition of a smartphone. So which is the most important of all of these is very difficult to say. But none of them can be ignored is what it amounts to because the one that you haven't got is the one that stops you being in business. So virtual components in an end product, just some ideas of taking apart what a smartphone looks like. I don't think many of you will be terribly surprised at that. But there is a lot of different things in there. Um, the signal processing, processing of mathematics, you know, to do the signal processing necessary for extraction of data from the uh, RF data stream. Mechanics, plastics, and glass. Way they're so low tech, aren't they? No, they're not. There are people who spend their entire lives looking at glass technology, and one of the things that came up, come about in that area is glass, which is coated in such a way that it doesn't get smeared with fingerprints and also the Gorilla glass, which is much less likely to shatter, and glass which is only a millimeter thick or less, which is what you have on your phone at the moment. Displays and transducers, manufacturing. You can't make these things, smartphones, um, by hand. You have to use automated processes. They're too small. The um, vibrators which are in there are little motors. Fantastic implementation. Can't actually be implemented by hand. You have to use robotic approaches on it. So the manufacturing is a part of that product which you don't necessarily think about. Test, again, it has to work. You expect these things to work. When you buy it, you don't expect it not to work. Uh, but somebody has to test it, and they have to correct it if it needs correcting. They're not 100% yield. They don't all work. So the physical components appear on what's called a bill of materials, and that tends to be what most, pe what most people focus on, because if you've got a factory, you're putting these things together. You have a box of bits associated with a smartphone, and ultimately, when you put them all together in the right order, you have no bits left over. And those, that bits list appears on there. But those virtual components are as, as important as the physical ones, because for no, if for no other reason, they have to be designed. So if you're a designer and you're designing smartphones, you could be designing the manufacturing process for smartphones, and that would still be part of the product, although it tends to be looked down at as something which is, which is not as exciting as real design. But if you're doing real design, are you doing the embedded software design, or are you doing the design of the test bench, the test suite for that embedded software? There's a lot of components, a lot of different roles associated with producing these things. Apple, back in 2011, was challenged because they said that they kept it, they, they were told, no, industry said to them that they were not uh, letting much of their business go outside. There was not much so-called ripple down. Well, they listed 159 tier one suppliers. That's all of the suppliers that they were using. Tier one suppliers are the people who supply the components that they finally assemble. There might be low tiers below that. There was 159 tier one suppliers, the thousands of design engineers, tens of thousands of engineers, and lots more in the two or three level. For example, ARM, who is a major supplier of technology, a virtual component, into, um, into Apple's products, is not on that list. Uh, uh, ARM is a tier two or even a tier three supplier. So these, the amount of work, the amount of roles that are in the tier two and tier three and tier one um, business of supplying these complex electronic systems is far greater than, than most people have understanding. I would say most, <coughs> most people, pretty well everybody. One thing I've found has been very useful along the way is working definitions. Sometimes it's difficult to describe things difficult to understand things. And part of the problem is overuse of terms. And so I, dis I define things as I go along. These are my definitions, and I refine them as, as time progresses. Uh, but the thing that's, that's registered with me is that there is a thing called end products. And these are the things that end customers buy. 
and you're an end customer. This is what you reach into your pocket for and you buy. You put your cash on the table. Now, <clears throat> conceptually, it's quite clear. That's where the cash flows back into the whole development process. Because that money is the thing which justifies everything else that went below it. So it feeds into the components and the subsystems and into the research and everything else that went on behind the technologies which came together into those products. Now systems then are very closely related to end products, although I th have to get this round. A, a system can be an end product, but not all end products are systems. So it's not a mutual um, uh, interchange. It's a, there is a mathematical term for it. I'm not sure what it is at the moment. But systems are complete in their end customer context. So a smartphone behaves like you'd expect a smartphone to behave. Um, the customer doesn't need to know how the smartphone works for it to work. Uh, they need to know how to handle the interface and the interface is human understandable. It doesn't, you don't need a degree or a PhD to, to operate one. It's because it it's delivers functionality and functionality are what people expect. They're black boxes. You don't see inside them very easily. So if somebody changes some part of its operation from hardware to software, it doesn't matter. From the system point of view, it still behaves the same. Subsystems are a little bit closer uh, to physical implementation. They're gray boxes mostly. They, have, they reveal some of their internal interface. Um, and essentially, their customers are not end customers. That's one thing you can say. These are technical customers. So they're people who are interested in using them in the context of some end product. So it, they have something in mind for this because they want to sell their product into this, into this supply chain of money and they, uh, and they need to have some exposure to it. So this could be an RF module or it could be a process uh, module, something which exists so you don't need to actually spend time designing it but nevertheless is going to be uh, used in an environment where you don't, uh, where you, so it's going to be used in a system context where the user uh, doesn't need to be aware of the details of its operation. And then you've got components which are fundamental. So these are, they are desire, encapsulations of desirable characteristics but very technical. Um, now a product, and as differentiated from an end product, because this is something which essentially has got a business plan associated with it, a product has to exist in the life cycle of an end product if it's going to be successful. Unless, so if I'm a company that's producing a resistor then I can only sell that resistor successfully and justify my business if I'm selling it to a customer who is going to use it in a module, who is going to use the module in a system, and he's going to use the system in an end product. Because it's only when the end product is actually flowing off the shelves in curries or whatever that the money flows back down to su supply the component supplier. And if that component supplier isn't um, fi fed with some money, then he may have a product, but he doesn't have a business. Businesses without uh, a, a, an economic value don't exist for very long. So where we are with technology then? Technology is never, never, ever, ever an end product. Technology are part of products, but they're not a product in their own right. So you can't take this idea of all we need to do is take science, develop it, because the best, best that we can hope for with developed technology, uh, science is a technology, and then it will become a product. It won't become a product. At the best, it's capable of being a component or an element of a product. It might be part of its manufacturing environment, it might be part of its test environment, or it might be part of a physical object that you normally associate with it. <coughs> but it's never a product in its own right. Um, they enhance the performance over alternatives. And that's interesting because that's, it doesn't say an awful lot. But it's the nature of human beings that we have abilities or interests, and we'll come back to it later on. We've had support for those from the very earliest days when we came out of a cave. If you think of it just putting clothes on to keep you warm. If you improve your clothes, by the introduction of a new technology, then all of a sudden the old way of doing clothes falls out of the window. You don't do it anymore, you move that way. 
So new technologies enhance the performance over alternatives. You think about what we do. This work lady is working very hard to get herself a phone. She needs a phone. And she's prepared to work to get that phone, to get some money, which is just a, 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 a method of exchanging work done for something else that she would like to have. So they all have to, on these products, products and end products, have to be economically viable. And that's a lot. They have, to be vi they have to have a viable business model. If a company can't make money out of this thing, then they haven't got a viable business model, then they won't be in business tomorrow. They can do it for a certain amount of money because of the cash you've got in your pocket, but you can't continue it into the future in any way, shape, or form unless it's got a viable business model. They have to cost less to develop and make than it costs to support, otherwise you haven't got a profit. And they have to do it at a level and a time scale that satisfies the investor's expectations. If somebody's lent you some money, they expect to see some return on that investment after a period of time, and you negotiated that with them. And if, it fail, if you fail to deliver it, then they're going to call their money back in, or call it a quits, not spend any more. So new technologies effectively are sold to businesses for the increased profit it offers them, always. Now you will come across this thing, it's called the technology readiness level. It's a thing which NASA uh, produced quite a few years ago now, and it tends to be quoted very uh, f uh, frequently in this space. So the idea is that science research is operating down here, and as it becomes more and more established and automated, then you get towards this technical technology readiness, readiness level 9. And the perception, at least, is that by the time it's got to 9, it's a product. Well, it's not a product. By the time it's got to 9, it's ready to be used in a product. A product development is 3 to 5 years. So when you make a smartphone, it takes 3 to 5 years to, de to design, to create, to prototype, to test, validate, and get it approved. The only reason that phones keep coming out on any regular basis is there's a pipeline. They're flowing forward from one to a an, to next, but each one of them has a time scale of about five years. So this technology is not a product at that point, but it can be sold into a business for an advantage that it's going to give that business. The business will use it, and three to five years from now, an end customer will start buying it, and the money will flow back down the chain. So up until that point, that technology is effectively living on borrowed, borrowed time. The investment which is necessary to produce a new product has covered some amount of payment to that, to that technology provider, but that everybody at this stage is way out on a limb. There's investors who've given, made lots of money available for setting up the production line, setting up the distribution channels, Designing the chips, qualifying the systems, all that sort of thing is money flowing out of the door which somebody has to pay for. And they're all, all holding their breath because they hope that it's going to pay off. Because only when it pays off does everybody back down the chain get it, including the investors. Business is very functional. Uh, it's about making money. It's not about using technology or employing people. And because technology is never a product in its own right, um, then technology only enables products, yes. Business adopts new technology when doing so gives its products a marketing edge. So it won't do, it's not interested in new technology unless it's going to give something which the end customer, even if you're way down the chain of the component supplier, if new technology in there is going to give something of value to the end customer, then they'll think about putting it in. But if it's only going to be 10%, it's not worth it, honestly. They can do that by just optimizing what they've already got. It's got to be, it's got to be bigger than that. <coughs> <coughs> so investors are nervous. They put money into this business. They don't want the business to change direction because that tells them that, they, that the business isn't going terribly well. Um, if I start up making cream teas and then decide I'm going to move into microelectronics because I've got an oven, doesn't mean to say that, uh, that that's, that's a very sensible business decision. And those people who've lent you money might quite reasonably say, 
I don't like the way this business is going. They're scrabbling around looking for something different. And you have to bear in mind that these investors are investing money frequently, which is yours. If you've got a pension fund, if you've got savings in the bank, then these people are the people who are providing this money. They have to be very careful with that money, and indeed you want them to be careful with that money. You don't want them to support companies or uh, research act activities which are dead ends. It's got to have some purpose, and they've got, to, they've got to keep an eye on it because they want to limit the vulnerability. A technology may be game-changing to some businesses, but not relevant to most. So simply because it's a, a wonderful technology, something simply that you, you've discovered something absolutely fantastic, may be totally irrelevant to most other businesses that you know. But somebody might see it as game-changing. Now the issue there, of course, is you have to know to take your technology to the people who are going to uh, be able to make the game-changing uh, change out of it. You take it to a whole lot of other people, the differences are going to be so small or not worth it, or the risk is so high, or the cost of doing it is so great, they're not even going to look at it. So businesses often have safer ways to achieve the same outcome. That's a, an interesting one, because uh, if you're in the business like um, ARM is in the business of improving the performance of its CPUs, um, then it does so in the main by tuning what went before. So changing of the decoder structure, changing of the way that some instructions are actually uh, decimated into uh, individual electronic phases um, will have 10-15% improvement in performance without changing anything of the design methods or the underlying technology. So things like that can be done. And low percentages of improvements are where businesses normally make, it, make its changes, evolutionary changes. So I'll now introduce you to the four phases of a business. Now, I've seen this in lots of presentations, but I've never seen it in a book. And the reason is that most businesses, when they're talking about businesses, they talk about starting up businesses. Now I'm going to identify the four areas of a business's life. There's the startup phase, and it's, a, it's something which is formed to deliver an element or an object to a consumer market. Now, they've, sell, they, they've sold the concept to some financier who's backing the effort that's necessary to start up this business, and they're all working furiously to produce that thing. Everybody is irreplaceable. So there may be six people in this company. They're all doing individual jobs. They're all vital. If any of them get run over by a bus, you've got a problem because somebody who was in the company to do something important is not there anymore. And this is not just engineering. This is product. Everybody knows the risk um, because they're all involved. It has an, and they all have an identified role in the machine. It's critical to the company's survival. Their role is critical to the company's survival. Their background, science, technology, and knowledge came with the group. So when they start up, they know what they're going to do. They're not interested in new ideas at that time. They're interested in doing the thing that they set themselves up to do. The financiers back them to do it. God help them if they look left or right. What they've got to do is deliver, and delivering is usually the problem. Now, when you get to phase two... That's following success of phase one. So you got your first product out. The customer is reasonably happy with it. It may be that you need to expand the market for it. It may be that you have to produce a second iteration of that product to make it more compact or, or make it look more attractive. Whatever. You're going to do something in phase two. Success falls on success. You now have uh, increasing numbers of people in the company. Your market, your founders who are essentially techn technologists, are moving into marketing, sales, and business roles because they've got to support that first product that went out. And as they move into those roles, they introduce new people into the company, and those new people take over essentially the roles that they were occupying. So the technical roles that they were doing are filled in by some new, new blood. Now, the organization starts to rationalize because it becomes aware at this point that it's vulnerable to individuals. It doesn't want to be vulnerable to individuals. It wants to get the technology out. It doesn't want somebody falling under a bus 
mattering too much. Uh, so they start to introduce procedures. These help newcomers to fit in, but they don't work everywhere, and some roles still need engineers because of the, uh, the breadth of knowledge that they're able to bring. Um, they may look around the technology horizon, but essentially they're evolving from what they already know at that phase. Success follows success. They move to the mature region. They've, they've got through their second, third, fourth product level. They've now got customers working, in increasing customer base. They have a sales, marketing div uh, divisions, departments. They have a HR department. That's a good sign, isn't it? Everybody needs a HR department to stop them accelerating too much. Um, but they also have lots of families, mortgages and dependents and investors. And they don't like risk, any of these people. People who've got a mortgage, they want to continue to get a wage. And they don't want the business, therefore, to take too many risks which are going to hazard their wage. So caution and logic start to prevail. Products become evolutionary, not revolutionary. Procedures make everybody replaceable. That's an important one. This is a big company now. It's cruising along. Uh, it it's knows its customer. It knows its products. And it's supplying all these things. Um, everybody is replaceable. It's a fairly secure pro uh, company. The, the, cus the customers of their technology products are happy to keep getting them from them. But that same rigidity stymies change. It stymies flexibility and stymies revolution. Reinvention, which may be required, is always difficult because the status quo, which is all of the people and the methods which are installed, make it so difficult to change. That, that resistance can be huge. And there are lots of stories behind all of these points, incidentally. And finally, there's demise. This is a part of the life of business. They all die, ultimately. And I think that that's an interesting one, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But it's disruptive technology, which ultimately kills a market, kills a company. Most businesses are unaware of the phases that they're in and the way it changes their operation. They just think of themselves as a business. And they, it's human nature to think of yourself as, I've always been like this, therefore I'll continue to be like this. So the business is, is a given, somehow. And so they don't analyze themselves. So a little bit more as a graph, because I find it interesting. So this is what revenue looks like. You know, in the startup, you've got next to no revenue. Then things start to turn up. You succeed in selling your first product. Um, then you move into the growth mode. You start, you, you produce your second product, and you start selling your second product. Then you move into the maturity uh, mode. You now have you're a, an established company. People know about you. You've got a whole bunch of established customers. You've got good sales and good support and all of that mechanism. And you're out here cruising away. Somewhere in your near future is demise. I don't know how long that is. It's not very long is the only thing I can say. Businesses, 10 years, 15 maybe. There is exceptions which last longer than that. But most businesses have a demise in their future. That's, this is what happens, however, once you're successful. Somebody comes along back here and they say, hey, these guys have got a good idea. We should start doing it. It takes them a while to get going. But they start doing it and they uh, compete with you. Now, they're not high. You know, they're down here somewhere. You don't worry too much about them. There may be several competitors. They may be doing quite well out of it, but you know, you've got the majority of the market. They're just down there playing, and you don't worry too much about them. The thing that gets you is this one. Because one of those competitors is actually doing something in a totally different way, and nobody thinks it's serious. And yet they emerge from the bunch of competition going like a rocket. Yes. For the next, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There is this disruptive technology. There's a book on it by Christensen. Well worth getting. Well worth reading. Um, dis it's called disruptive technology when good technologies fail or when good big companies fail. Something like that. I think I've got a reference to it somewhere. Uh, I can certainly give you that. But that is a panic situation because the first thing that this incumbent company realise is 
their profits are going down. They don't really understand why, but there's some new kid on the block and they're taking all of the, all of the money. Not surprisingly, their reaction is panic. Uh, what they should have done was to reinvent themselves back there. When they were sitting in this comfortable maturity role, uh, position, cruising, as I call it, they're, t they're just happy. Everybody goes around with a smile on their face. They've got, they're making money. They've got customers. They're happy. Don't need to change anything, guys. We're happy. What they should have done is to be reinventing themselves. Even though they don't know about the disruptive technology, they should be anticipating that if they don't do nothing, then somebody is going to do something to steal their market. Steal their market. Think about that one in a moment. So this is the, f the flexible phases of company at that time. So a company is most flexible before it's a startup. That's a negative one, if you will. But if you have a start, if you're before a startup phase, you have next to no investors. You, you're just out there with the clouds. You're, you're, you're thinking like a fairy thinks, flitting from here and here to there. And then suddenly you have an idea that you want to try and commercialize this in some way. Your flexibility is going downhill very quickly at that point. If you're going to commercialize it, somebody who's going to support you wants you to commercialize that, not something else. And so your flexibility dies very quickly when you're in the startup phase. You focus on your deliverable. Now, the flexibility during the growth phase, you're not really allowed to change, change streams or go left or right. Towards this end of the um, a company's existence, some parts of it might be starting to realize that they need to do some, some uh, reinvention. Most of the company doesn't think so. There's a lot of inertia. We're happy doing what we're doing, guys. A lot of people smiling. And you're saying that our ship's got a hole in it? Yeah, come on. We're cruising along nicely. So there is a little bit of openness to new technology. But the new real openness comes in when that di dive has started. Because at that point, panic is what's incentivizing these, this company. It realizes that if it doesn't do something, then it's going to lose the entire market. And the problem is, they're not thinking about time scale here. They're talking about something now. We need something now. Anybody got any good ideas what we could do to get something now? Because if we don't get something now, we're going downhill. It's clutching at straws. And you have to be very careful of people who are clutching at straws because if they're coming to you looking for research outcomes they're going to drag you down because they're going to tell you this is what's most important to us you focus all your effort on it they go down it doesn't matter that they've they've refocused your efforts but what you have done is you've burned a lot of effort delivering something which nobody wants so there are only limited times when a company is open to external change and they need different things at different times you have to anticipate that. Now to the net worth. Of course, the other thing that's happening here is what the investors are doing. They're funding this startup. There may be a plan, a bit of a soft start. How far can you go, guys, before we give you any money at all? And then you start spending. And you spend. And during this time, you're spending quite a lot. Now, that's all negative. You haven't really got much revenue at that point. So you, you still, uh, your net worth is still heav heavily negative. And the thing that your investors, angel investors, are interested in is how many years before you break even. And that can be quite a few years, actually, five or six years into a company, into a company's existence before the company breaks even, before the investors get back what they put in. So not made profit on it yet, just get back what they put in. And of course, not all companies do that. That's the uh, reality in an awful lot of cases is they, the investors are not keen for them to spend much more money. They're getting some revenue, but actually they still are above zero. And uh, 19 out of 20, roughly, are uh, businesses which end up doing that. And investors never really get their money back from them. Somewhere after, about here, they often sell out at a loss just to, to, to put the thing to bed. Uh, companies often, they merge, they migrate, they do all sorts of things trying to keep alive but only like 1 in 20 does reasonably well. 1 in 100 does very well. A lot of startups fail. You don't hear much about that. And because investors are worried about their money, which is your money really, 
They want you to have skin in the game, real skin in the game. They want you to mortgage your house. They want you to mortgage your wife and your kids or husband and kids, whichever which, whichever which way around you're talking about, because they want to know that you really believe in the story that you're selling them. Because if you don't believe it, why should they believe it? <clears throat> so successful businesses supply what their customers need. It's a fairly obvious thing to say. But, uh, you know, salesmen selling this wonderful thing, the customer really only wants something to open the tin of paint. Uh, they're both called screwdrivers. Um, and it's very easy to, to make a mockery of that, but it's, a, it's understanding what your customer needs is an important part of your success. You may sell him one, but you won't sell him a hundred million. And it's the hundred million that is in your business plan. And so it's not a success simply because you've sold something. You have to establish a relationship. The other aspects of it I've mentioned before, and you can have a copy of all of these slides, so it's not a, a problem. But if a customer doesn't actually need it, or if you fail to deliver as promised, then the relationship is spoiled, and potentially forever. Not only will they not come back, but it might actually kill the business as well. Now, I've always wanted to put up a slide with nudes on. Just a personal challenge to me. I've never managed to do it before. So what do end customers need? Well, in 1972, Pioneer spacecraft carried that plaque out into space. Some day to be discovered by somebody who would make some sense out of it. It says an awful lot about us. It says that we have big brains. We've got hair on the top of our heads to keep them warm. Uh, we have dexterous forelimbs. We can stand there and we wave our forelimbs. We've learned we have the ability to manipulate things as well as move. We have a perception of time because this plaque was put on a spaceship with the idea that it was going to be discovered at some time in the great distant future. We didn't just put it there for, for no reason. And that we're natural consumers because that is a very, very basic thing that we are. We can't survive in many environments because we're just not equipped for it. We need extensions to our bodies to enable, them, enable us to do almost anything. And those extensions, the ability for us to, to perceive the extensions, the abil ability for us to put them on and then to move into environments where we otherwise couldn't have done, in, in, in involves a huge amount of intel intelligence over a cow or a horse. We are under-equipped to survive off the land. Animals are much, much better at this than we are. Almost every animal in the whole world, animal, insects and so on, is much better at this than we are. The naked human needs almost everything just to live uh, and to provide that from their own ingenuity or from the ingenuity of others forces us to be social creatures. Maslow loved this, captured this in his own five hierarchy of needs. Uh, these essentially, in proportion, to the amount that we're prepared to pay to have them. So it matters, our basic physiological needs matter most. Our self-actualization needs matter least. So if we haven't got basic physiological needs, then we will not spend money on a new smartphone. Buying this human weakness became our strength because it, needed, it, it allowed us to survive. We needed technologies to help us. Our brains became ingenious. We could imagine how life would be better in the future, and it gave us the flexibility to thrive in all of Earth's environments and some beyond. Um, but beneath our protective shells, we are still those vulnerable animals. And that's the reason why we're consumers. So bearing in mind that technologies only enhance end products, then the things that we are buying are things which fit into that triangle somewhere. And the use of technology only enhances what they are. So we're interested in houses. We're interested in Gore-Tex, but not really interested in Gore-Tex. We're only interested in waterproof clothing because that helps us to survive in some, in, uh, some environments. We're interested in seeing greater distances, talking over greater distances, communicating and memory. Pen and paper worked very nicely for quite a few years. Now we have cameras and we also have um, voice recorders. Uh, we also can still write things down, not using a pen and paper necessarily. Um, a gun came in for security and hunting. You know, all of these are technology enhancements on the 
things that we were doing in generations before. We've achieved a lot of advances in a lot of things over my lifetime and they've all been achieved one small competitive step at a time by competition. So they've, they've done things to the products which have improved them by little stages and people have bought them and the ones that have succeeded are the ones that people have bought. Now why do we need new products? It's a big question. If you're in a, in a mature phase of your business, you know what to do and you're doing it and your customers are happy, then you don't need new products. You just continue making the money you're making. There's a lot of businesses that are like that, lots of them. All businesses exa exist to make money out of what they know, not out of what they don't know. It's not promise stuff, it's taking what they know and applying it in a way which is going to produce a product which is different from the alternatives for that product and will offer them an advantage in the market. New products are primarily done to disrupt your competitor. They're not done because, hey, that would be a cool thing to do. They're doing it because if they can steal the market from Joe, then we can have a bigger slice of the pie ourselves. And if we can make the market bigger at the same time, hey, that's wonderful. That's the way the products are developed. That's why products are developed. If it doesn't do that, then companies aren't interested in doing it. So business still needs research, however, because business is going to go down a path and it needs to know where to, where to go. And research, technical and business, is necessary to give them some confidence about that route before they set off down it. It's just like having scouts in the... Uh, in the uh, days of the cowboys and Indians. You needed a scout to tell you where to go. That's the role that research provides in business. It needs technical research for the tools directly, tools and methods directly associated with the product, but it also needs non-technical research. If you look at things like smartphones that you buy these days, you don't pay the actual cost of making them. You pay a small percentage and then you pay forever to have it. And that's the novelty, if you like, in the business model which has changed. And it doesn't matter whether you change the business model or, make, or you make the phone half the price. If it gives you a difference with your competitors, then you're the one who gets the market. Uh, so selling your research outcomes. Um, because end products incorporate many technologies, then introducing a new technology must deliver a visible benefit to the end product because otherwise it's not worthwhile. And when you're selling your science or technology to a business, you have to be able to visualize, therefore, how it would be transform, how it would transform an end product which used it. You may be selling a resistor down there, but unless you can see how an end customer would benefit from having your particular resistor in there, then you haven't got a business model. You haven't got a plan. If you miss sell your product, well, all you're doing is pushing your company, your, your customer out of business. I've got to skip fairly quickly through at this point. Business exploitation of research outcomes. Uh, as we've seen, it's not easy to radically change what a business does. Uh, and it's to get your research into any business, they have to convince their stakeholders of the value of doing it. So it, it runs right up the chain. You have to envisage the value to the end product of your technology. How big an edge should your thing, your innovation produce? If it's one or two years from a customer using it, then you're looking at orders of doubling, you know, times two is a good, a good indication. If it's three to five years away from a customer actually using it, then you should be looking at an order of magnitude. Anything smaller than that will be diminished by time. Order of magnitude may be power, performance, cost, saleability, all sorts of aspects. It doesn't have to be just one function times 10. It can be accumulative. And if it's more than five years away, then you should be looking for 100 times, two orders of magnitude improvement. Because if you're still fiddling around with 5 and 10% improvement over the status quo today, people will get there before you do. So the thing you have to be aiming at has got to be significantly better if the further away it is from being currently usable. These will all get diluted. These factors will all get diluted by time. 
And you will also refocus as you realize, as you understand your research more clearly, you will realize how it needs to be addressed to different companies and different markets. <coughs> and also bear in mind that most businesses have a list of things they would like to do already. So your new introduction competes with the things that they've already would like to do and haven't got money or finance or resources, people, skills or whatever to do. They're going to fa tend to favor the thing that uh, they already know rather than something new. So scientific, some, uh, some roles quickly. Scientists discover, engineers create, technicians apply. None is better than the other. Technicians are very, very good at doing processes which are established using tools which are sophisticated and they will be better at it than engineers or scientists. Scientists discover new things, fundamental things, not attached to products, but could be attached to products. Engineers create, they create product. They are the, the bridge between science and the commercial market whereby that science will be funded. And in fact, Einstein agreed with this. He said this, scientists investigate that which it already is. Engineers create that which has never been. Engineers create new stuff as a part of what they do. It is their role. Now, I've talked about those classes of people because of this graph, because here we have heads this time. The heads are growing in the business. But the other thing that's not known about that is the way the, the abilities of those heads change. In the beginning, the mix was scientists and engineers. In growth period, it becomes engineers and technicians. In maturity, it becomes technicians and operatives. Now, if you take that situation, sales are dropping like a rock. Our plan is to invent something, something hey novel that everyone will want to buy. Doesn't everybody want to do that? All right, I told you where to go, go away and do it. It's not a practical business model. That reinvention needs scientists and engineers. But the, re the business is full of technicians and operatives. You may want to get, do that thing. You may have the do, do hickey model thing that you want to produce, but you can't even do it because you're talking about this period of time and you've got totally the wrong mix of people in the business. <coughs> so wise words of politicians, do businesses listen to politicians? No. Businesses know what they want to do. They know what their business is. Politicians are amateur business people. Um, mostly they're ordinary people taken from the street who happen to have fallen on their feet and got themselves a good political job. But they don't know much about business. The businesses hate competition. Politicians love it. This is a fundamental one, actually. Politicians love it because competition drives price down. Businesses hate competition because it drives price down. That means their profitability. It means that they can't, if they want to do something outside of their normal realm of business, like reinvent themselves, they haven't got much money to do it. So the thing that businesses want to do is to destroy competition. I think politicians want to do is to create it. That means that businesses can never trust what politicians say to them about what is good business because it's fundamentally not in their interest of business. Partnership is the, is the role. Help your customers to understand their future and let them guide you in yours. Businesses who are running on a daily basis are very focused on running the business. You need to tell them about what their future holds. And you also need to let them guide you about what uh, your research should do because they can tell you a lot more about running the business. You can tell them a lot more about running the future. So partnerships is the way that research and industry works together and identifying the people that you work with, that you're talking to the right people, that they understand what you're talking about, that you understand what they're talking about is so fundamental to, to success. It has to be focused that way. Anyway, conclusions then. Now I'll rattle through these. Science and technology enable products but are never end products in their own right. Very important one, which is why it's highlighted. Businesses exist to profit from exploitation of know-how. Know-how is stuff they know. Exploitation is making money. It's not bad. 
If you're making money, not all of it, there are always people who make bucket loads of money, disproportional amounts of money, but the vast majority of people just kind of do better than you, with interest that you can get from the bank. So an awful lot of people lose a lot of money to gain a bit. Um, getting science into a product has to offer significant end product advantage. So whatever you're doing, keep an eye on, keep moving it around, but whatever you're doing in research, keep thinking about the end product that this could help and how it would transform that end product. If you're a long way away from it, 10% improvement isn't good enough. Orders of magnitude is what you're looking for. Keep your research in the life cycle of an end product. If your research has no end product in mind, it's not going to ever be in the life cycle of it. If it's not in the life cycle, then that flow down of cash doesn't happen. One way or another, it will, kill, it will be killed. And remember that it's what the end customer buys that pays for the whole life cycle. And at that point, thank you for listening. And this is all available now. You can pick up the PDF on that, on that um, website. And there will be a video in the next couple of days. Thank, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you.